And my name's Mike Potts. I am the co-founder uh, and current CEO of Feature 23. We're a product development firm here in Jacksonville. Uh, we've been in the community now, I can't believe it, but almost 20 years. Uh, I was actually in the Navy here back when I did those types of things. And uh, after a couple of years abroad, we actually came back, raised our family here, and eventually started our company here. A couple of things you need to know about me, though, before I get started. I am a hand talker. Uh, and all I can do is apologize for that, but I'm a hand talker and it's not a good thing. You'll see in a, in a little bit what I mean by that. Also, uh, they've mic'd me. And when I get passionate about things, uh, I, my, my volume does elevate. I have people in the audience, you just saw that happen. I have people in the audience that protect me from me. So if my volume starts to elevate, I'll try to read uh, cues. But uh, being prior military, you learn to project your voice when you get excited or nervous or passionate about something. So you're likely going to see that. Also, um, there's going to be a little bit of audience participation tonight. I'm trying to make it a little bit of fun for everybody. Uh, the fun part is those who I'm going to be participating with don't yet know that they're going to be participating. So it should be a good time for everybody involved. Now, tonight's topic, why tonight's topic? Uh, I've been doing this programming thing a little bit. Uh, when you look at architecture through the ages, it's changed quite a bit from when I started programming to what it looks like now. Through that time, the way we make decisions about software and specifically architecture has shifted. What this means is, as the industry changes, we become somewhat um, accountable uh, focused, uh, we become a, a little bit more focused on um, mistakes. Mistakes right now in architecture, are, if you're not keeping up with the news, it's costing companies millions and b -b -b billions with a big B. So as I tried to figure out what I wanted to talk about, I figured that software architecture was probably the best place to come, talk about how these things are shifting. We're referring to this as a growing culture of accountability in the technology industry. And again, I'm gonna start with the most recent one, Boeing. Uh, if you're not paying attention to what's happened at Boeing, um, we don't quite yet know if what they did was illegal or unethical or just probably not a good decision making. So from uh, an architecture in the age of accountability, decision making and patterns. At the end, this presentation is about decision making and patterns. And I want you guys to bear that in mind. To get our thinking right, what do I mean by decision making and patterns? Right now when you guys do your job, and, and just so I know, how many people here are computing professionals separate from executives, project managers, project, how many of you actually write code? Okay, good. So right now when you guys make decisions about your architecture, how much process goes into that? How accountable are you really? It's been my experience as a software engineer that the team makes these decisions primarily based on an average need. They come in, the business says I need A, we sit down as a team and we kind of figure it out. But when we say accountability, where does accountability actually come from? In most professions, accountability comes from one of two places, the profession itself, the people in that profession. So think attorneys, think uh, doctors, accountants, those professions have made their mistakes because they've been around a lot longer and the professions kind of protect them from themselves. The other place that accountability comes from is regulators. And again, you see this in professions where the profession didn't quite get there first, but because we made a mistake uh, as an industry, the regulators step in and they try to protect common society from us because we didn't get there first. How many of you are old enough to remember Sarbanes-Oxley as an example of that? That's a great example of the regulator stepping in because CIOs would get in front of Congress and say, I didn't know. I didn't know we were spending money on that. I didn't know that that happened. So Sarbanes and Oxley got together and said it is now illegal. It is illegal for CIOs to get in front of Congress and say, I didn't know. Sarbanes-Oxley, when I started programming, was new. Companies had to go through and completely change the way they did technology because of Sarbanes-Oxley. It was like a global reboot. I come in on a Friday, Sarbanes-Oxley passes on a Monday, my job looked completely different. But it took us three years to learn to do that. From an accountability standpoint, because as a profession we didn't get there first, the regulators did it for us. 
Why is accountability important? When I started writing software, I was, I was fortunate. I, I hoped to get one of the three programming jobs that the company had available. Programming at that time was fairly innocuous. We wrote software for things like reporting. We wrote software for things like automation. And for the most part, we were invisible. People didn't even know we existed, except for the other programmers. But there were only three of us. It was a very lonely field, believe it or not. Since that time, and believe it or not, I have to admit this out loud, but in that time, the internet has actually become a thing. When I started programming, yes, the internet was not a thing. Uh, now, it's everywhere, and we won. When I started programming, I remember being in meetings trying to convince the, the executives, you gotta take us more seriously. We can do more stuff, man. There's more that we could do to raise the value of the organization. Now, the stakes are much, much higher. Every organization is or wants to be a software organization. We're everywhere. Most companies in the modern era couldn't run without software. When we make mistakes, the implications are significantly higher than they used to be. Now, to get our heads right for the rest of the presentation, I was trying to figure out what question best represented what it could look like for software if we were more accountable of our own choosing. So this is the question that I picked. What if your career actually depended on the success of your next project? Now in the first draft, my presentation said, what if your life depended on it? And the reviewer said, come on now, let's not be so dramatic. So I did have to bring it down a couple of notches. But let's pretend like your career, and it's important, depends on the success of your next project. As I go through the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna ask you to be honest with yourselves. Examine how decisions get made at your workplace, within your team, or within your organization. Just be honest with yourself, and as we get to the end of the presentation, you'll see why I ask you to do that. Since this presentation is about decision-making and patterns, and as the title indicated, that decision-making and patterns is specific to software architecture. We can't really go too much further if we don't agree on what is architecture. Now, this is one that I've argued with many, many people about through the years. I had my own opinions. So what I finally did was I do what all smart software engineers do, and I just codified on Martin Fowler. You can't argue with that. You can argue with me all day long, but Martin Fowler, in 2005, wrote a paper called Who Needs an Architect? And there's a link, it's a fantastic paper. In trying to write that paper, Martin Fowler himself wrestled with the definition of architecture. So what did he do? He emailed Ralph Johnson. And if you don't know Ralph Johnson, I encourage everybody to go Google Ralph Johnson. He's one of the gang of four. He was the teacher of patterns which really influenced a lot of people, including Martin Fowler. In that email exchange, they were examining what is architecture. The reason they were doing so was the IEEE published a definition for what is architecture. And as you can imagine, those of us who were programming at the time did not agree with the definition, but we didn't have a better one. Well, Martin Fowler and Ralph Johnson went on through this email exchange to agree that, and I'm not joking, architecture is the important stuff, whatever that is. Now, to go a little deeper into that, you need to go read the paper. It seems a little crazy that, that the smartest people in the world basically said stuff and junk, but that's what they did. <laughs> read the email exchange, and they go a little bit further, but not too much further. At the end of the day, they say that architecture is the expert developer's shared understanding about the system's design. So let's think about that for a minute. You're a developer working on a project. As you go through and make decisions on that, you're gonna reach out to more senior people, your boss, contractors, and you're gonna make decisions based on things like concurrency, uh, reporting, portability of data, HIPAA, PCI. Before you actually build the project, most engineers aren't capable of predicting what they're gonna need to do. So in the end, most architectures are represented by the choices we've made Ralph Johnson in his exchange with Martin Fowler says, one interesting subtext to architecture is it's the stuff you wished you could get right early, but aren't going to. So if we start with architecture as a collection of decisions that represent our shared understanding of the system's design, at the end of the day, architecture is achieved through decision making. Everybody on the same page so far? I always love the last day of a conference, by the way. People have been drinking out in the sun. 
How do we make decisions about architecture? And this is another one, believe it or not, it took me a long time to wrestle with. There are some really good books out there that talk about heuristics as, as you know, judgment calls or insight or experience where as more senior engineers wrestle with problems, we develop these things that are referred to as heuristics that we can use to guide the decision making of less experienced people. So when you're a college student, you know, and if you're a college student in here, this isn't a knock on you, you're just early in your trajectory. But when you're a college student, you don't really have heuristics. You can be as smart as they come. You can have all the theory in the world. But until you've wrestled with some problems, you can't really be said to have a whole lot of heuristics. Now, by definition, a heuristic is anything that provides a plausible aid or direction in the solution of a problem. But in the end, it's not justifiable, right? I'll give you a perfect example, and this is our first test of audience participation. I say, what is Martin Fowler's first rule of distribution? And you say? Don't distribute. Don't distribute. Okay, that's a heuristic. Now that heuristic evolved over time because people kept trying to distribute their software and every developer who's tried to do it will tell you why it's a bad idea, yet we continue to do it. But we, we call it different things for sure. Other examples of heuristics that we use, Brooks Law, Solid Principles, Object Oriented Programming. At the end of the day, heuristics are strategies derived from previous experience with similar problems. Now this is critical to understanding decision making around architecture because right now architecture is a collective game. It is a team sport. You're only as good as the heuristics of the team. Where do heuristics come from? In practice. So I see Mr. Sean Willison in the audience. I hope Mr. McDermott is here. As a senior engineer, there were no two engineers that were a bigger pain in my ass as a senior engineer than those two individuals. The reason is, Heuristics are taught. They're acquired through painful practice at times. One way to build your, your tool bag of heuristics is through mentoring. And here's what that looks like. A junior engineer, you give them a problem and they say, hey, I think I'm gonna take this approach. And as a senior, you say, that's a bad idea. Don't do it that way. Now, Sean, Sean would argue with me. I believe I can make that work. Now I'm gonna say something that for those of you who know me, you'll understand where this next saying came from and it's Sean Willison's fault. <laughs> but he actually sat just to my right for, for a couple of years and Sean would say, but I believe I can make that work. And I'd say, fine, go do it. And he would come back and in that process, he would apply both trial and error and mentoring. And because he would do that, he would acquire heuristics faster than anybody I've ever met minus Mr. McDermott in the back. Now. This became such a pattern of behavior that Sean and I didn't even communicate after a while. Sean would say, I believe I can make it work, and I would say, I believe that you believe that, right? <laughs> so, and I use this, many people aren't happy about it, but you'll understand now where, where that came from. But heuristics are acquired is the basic point of that. Now, the next key component to decision making where architecture is concerned is when I have a collection of these heuristics. Now, when you have a collection of heuristics and skills, you have what's referred to as the state of the art, who you are today. It's time stamped. Who Sean Willison and RJ McDermott and the rest of you are today is not who you were four years ago. The heuristics that you've acquired make you the engineer that you are today, plus those skills. Now, that actually aggregates up. You have a state of the art, which we refer to as a soda, Collectively, you and your team have a state of the art or a soda. Now, when organizations give teams problem, they're actually banking on the fact that the team soda is what's gonna deliver on the problem, not the individual engineer. And if you've ever been on a really good team, you understand how powerful a collective soda can be. Now, state of the art, as it relates to decision making, this is the first big kind of waypoint along in this discussion. Just like you have a soda and your team has a soda, your organization has a soda. Let's say that as a developer, you're working in an organization that does a lot of jQuery, and that happens still today, by the way. And they hire a React expert to come in. Now that React expert has that in the soda. soda React is in their soda, there's no question. They know how to do it, know how to debug it. Nobody else knows how to do it. Right? 
Let's say we finally managed to get the team up to par, now we're all doing React. Do your network engineers know how to deploy it? Now, I could just as easily use SignalR for this one. If your organization doesn't know or their soda doesn't include bits and pieces of what you're capable of, we're working in conflict with one another from an architectural standpoint. The state of the art is an important part of developing professional responsibility. Let's take it one step further. What does the industry currently say is good web development? What does a good web app look like according to the industry? Right, if I survey 200 developers, right, what would they say is good web app? Is it gonna be client side? Is it gonna be server side? The opinions are gonna vary so diversely that this is the single biggest problem in our industry when it comes to decision making and professional responsibility. We can't agree. We can't agree on anything except the extremes. If I asked you about JavaScript, in 1999 when I started coding, if I actually included JavaScript in my application, I got fired because JavaScript was considered to be a security vulnerability in most networks. They didn't know how to deal with it. When XML HTTP requests came on the scene, I actually built an app with it and deployed it, and I got fired as a contractor. And I said, but, 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 best practices. And they said, but, 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 security. It was a standard, they just said we don't do that. Today, if you hire me as a contractor and ask me to build a web app, and I tell you that I'm gonna gracefully degrade down to no JavaScript at all, I'm gonna get laughed out of the building and fired for not deploying JavaScript. It is literally impossible to build a web app in the modern era well, I shouldn't say literally, quite nearly impossible to build a new web app in the modern era without both Node and Webpack. Now imagine a world where JavaScript was illegal. You, you can't imagine the difference in that. Another good example on that, I would say, is Webpack itself. If I ask you, even in the last five years, what is jQuery? When I mentioned jQuery, I heard some giggles. I always, kinda, that, I always find that kind of interesting because we have some organizations that are still wrestling with whether they should get off jQuery or not, but even within jQuery, it was, I believe, state-of-the-art maybe eight years ago. But since then, it's somewhat questionable. Where is it on the spectrum of, of state-of-the-art? Now, as a developer, you have heuristics, you have a soda. Why do we have jobs? Why do we get hired? And this is where I get into my first most heated debate with most developers. Why do we have jobs? Why are we here? Well, most organizations hope to take advantage of our skills to create value, business value, typically through profit. But we're there to increase or protect business value. So in some cases, it's to reduce or limit risk. Quite often in the modern world, the digital transformation focus is really around improving or protecting operational definitions. In the end, we're there to help them create a happy, healthy, fiducially responsible organization. And I say fiducially responsible because the nonprofits, I can't really say profitable. But fiducial responsibility is, is really kind of the focus for professional responsibility. That's why we get hired. We get hired to help organizations create happy, healthy organizations. We do not get hired to write code. Now, you can disagree with me on that all day long, but I have yet, in 25 years of working with organizations, find an organization that will let me write code. The code I want, the code the way I want, on the topics I want. It simply doesn't happen. Nobody gets hired to write code. Everything comes back to professional responsibility. Now, from an architectural standpoint, if the goal is a happy, healthy, fiducial organization, the idea is that we have these heuristics and these sodas. What governs right and wrong? Again, I'm gonna focus on Boeing. I believe that Boeing was trying to do the fiducially right thing. They were trying to reduce costs. They were trying to grow the top line. They were trying to move into a new market. So what went wrong? What happened at Boeing? Well, they rushed a few things. They rushed some decision making. They rushed some project management. They decided to play, we think, at least early indications are they tried to play an outsourcing uh, switch for access to a new market, right? Businesses do this all day long, negotiation. Well, was it wrong? If it's fiducially responsible, what was so wrong with what Boeing did? Well, they started killing people because they started rushing decisions. It's not illegal what they did, but it certainly might be unethical. So ethics is how we kind of grind everything back into our decision making. When you make decisions about a company software architecture, what governs right and wrong? Is it really about what makes you a happy, productive developer or what makes the organization fiducially responsible? At Feature, we kind of started to define ethics our own way. Being ethical was working within your soda. 
or the soda of the collective or the soda of the organization. When we write software for other organizations, we actually take time to say, what architecture am I building for you? Because you've got to maintain it. And believe it or not, about half our work still includes jQuery because the organizations we're building for don't know how to work outside of that. To that, we also add knowingly working on or delivering technology that does not deliver business value. That's a big part of our ethical kind of framework. If you're working on technology or you're building something into the application that's not tied directly to the business value or the fiducial responsibility of that organization, we consider that to be unethical. And again, uh, I'm going to use Volkswagen here. Legal does not equal ethical. There's a lot of things in this world that are legal that you can do, but you probably shouldn't. Over time though, the unethical stuff often becomes illegal. And again, we're gonna see uh, Volkswagen. What happened there become a precedent in our organization. Starting to bring all this back together, because it does have a point, I promise. Let's look at some recent ethical opportunities from a decision-making standpoint that's going to affect you guys as professionals. Boeing, the easy one. What about Equifax? Was what they did illegal? Was it even really unethical? Right, from a decision-making standpoint, the failures in that architecture, who's accountable for that? What went wrong? What failed? Somebody certainly made a decision to include those technologies. Panera, how many of you are familiar with what happened to Panera, actually? Okay, so Panera had a vulnerability in their main site, which was leaking. Anybody who signed up for the Panera card, you could actually go to the public Panera.com and using some query string optimizations, you could go pilfer a bunch of other people's data, email addresses, names. Some security uh, experts actually reported this to Panera. And Panera, there are some emails out there where Panera basically told them to, to blow off and they left it open for several months. Well, at the end of the day, Panera is contributing to you know, the dark web and uh, hopefully not too much identity theft, but some. Well, who should be held accountable for that? From an architectural standpoint, how, how hard would it have been to actually close that off? When does the examination around that begin as the developer who created that vulnerability? Volkswagen, at this point, the most popular example in the world for architectural bad decision making. Now, in this case, the developer did what they were told. Now, I gotta be honest with you. That gentleman went to prison for 40 months, and I can tell you personally, having been in the field for a long, long time, had Volkswagen called me five years ago and hired Feature 23 to deliver on a project, I would have jumped through hula hoops. Yes, I'm down, I will absolutely build software for you. Now, I've been in a room when I've been given requirements that I didn't feel so good about. Now, I don't always know what you do with the software that I write. Now, I can tell you that I empathize with the gentleman that actually got those requirements. They were in the requirements. The company asked me to do this. Well, at what point then are we accountable for doing what we're asked to do? I gotta tell you, as a contractor, I get asked to do a lot. You, I've had to learn to develop a bit of a filter or a bone for like, this doesn't feel right. Now, as a business, I'm big enough that I can start turning down work if it doesn't feel right. But as an independent contractor, are you really gonna fight the requirements you're given? At the same time, when I sign a master services agreement, I'm signing a contract to deliver, and most of my contracts say the software will be delivered per the requirements, okay? So now I've got a bit of a dilemma, right? And then Facebook. <laughs> For me, that's the easy example of unethical end-to-end. -end. Uh, you know, at some point, regulation's coming because Zuckerberg just can't help himself. Um, here recently, <laughs> The Wall Street Journal, I believe, um, they reported that Zuckerberg is going to be required to personally sign off individually on all privacy compliance moving forward. So if that's not accountability forced on you, I'm not sure what else is. And then this. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about Gartner. I got a bit of a love-hate relationship with them. But if they say it, it happens. If they say it, it's law. Your executives, all your executives have Gartner subscriptions. They pay thirty to $100,000 a year for advice. This is what keeps them from getting fired, right? It used to be if I hired Microsoft or IBM, I didn't get fired as an executive. Now it's, uh, I've got Gartner. And if you're listening to Gartner, even if it's wrong, you're not gonna get fired. Well, Gartner just told every executive in the world that digital ethics is a thing. They listed it as number nine on their top 10 digital tech trends for 2019. 
they quoted ethical considerations should be built in, not bolted on. So now, bringing this back around to your decision making, your heuristics, your state of the art as teams, as organizations, and as an industry, who's going to be the one that makes the decision on accountability for something as broad as ethics should be built in, not bolted on? Now, the first thing I thought about when I read that was that didn't work out so well for test-driven development. Quality should be built in, not an after. But we still argue about TDD. I, I don't even know what the right version of TDD is, right? Red, green, refactor, that's about all I got at this point. And I know I should have some tests in there somewhere. But depending on who you listen to, it shouldn't be 100%. What about ethics? Where does it fit? Is that really the developer's responsibility or somebody higher up in the stack? Volkswagen set the precedent, the developer level. This is where the age of accountability came from. Welcome to the age of accountability. Walking back through in summary on this part of the presentation, accountability is coming. If you go out and research in the last five years, the number of CIOs who've been fired for ethical lapses has risen by 68%. When you combine that with the fact that companies continue to violate consumers' privacy and the ethical issues continue to proliferate, Boeing is now killing passengers because they were trying to save money and grow into a new market. We are now quite properly in the age of accountability. Okay, and Gartner put an exclamation point on that. As software engineers who are currently making decisions about software in the age of accountability, I can tell you I've been on a lot of teams where I went home happy about to commit on Friday, had a team meeting, everybody's in a good spot. I come in on Monday, and one of the developers surprises me with, hey, I went ahead and upgraded the client-side framework to Vue.js because you know React is so 2018, and after breakfast on Sunday, I went ahead and Kubernetes up the application. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, I gotta run down the hall to the client and say, okay, uh, I don't know how your DevOps team feels about Kubernetes. Uh, I don't even know what stack you're on, but one of my developers decided that it was time to upgrade everything to the latest state of the art, if you will, with zero consideration for the team, the company, or even where the industry industry's at on some of these things. But in the age of accountability, somebody's going to begin being held accountable for the bad decision making. Make no mistake about it. If you're on a team that's costing your company Thousands, tens of thousands. I've been on projects where bad decision making is currently costing some of our clients hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Well, at some point in the age of accountability, who's going to be brought into the corner office to, to answer for that? We believe it feature, we believe it's going to be the engineer. This is how other professions got there. The doctor is held accountable, the attorney is held accountable, the accountant is held accountable for their individual decision making, even in a group setting. I have no reason to believe it won't be the same for us in a profession. Everything about this presentation up to this point was so that I can show you these next three heuristics. If you're in the age of accountability, what can you do about it as a software engineer? A lot of time, a lot of big topics, uh, a lot of generalizations up to this point. Things like heuristics. I could have done an entire presentation on just heuristics. But trying to bring it forward to something that you can take back to work with you. There are three heuristics that every engineer in here can apply to their job right now that will make you a better software engineer, will help you create better software, help you participate in your professional responsibility in creating a help, happy, healthy, fiduciary responsible organization and set you up to be a more accountable part of the profession. Now, I'm gonna bring back the first slide and say please remember and please be honest with yourself about how decision makings are actually happening because somebody in this room was the developer I described just 30 seconds ago. I've been that guy on a weekend where I had nothing else to do and figured to hell with it. At least I'll have something I enjoy working on when I get to work on Monday. It happens to every software engineer. As I go through these three heuristics, I'm gonna give you some examples of how that happens and how you should probably handle that as a team and as a software engineer. The first heuristic are the current tools, languages, frameworks, and approaches that you're using as a software engineer in your state of the art right now. 
It's easy to look at old MVC code and not feel good about it. It happened to me just this last week. I didn't feel good inside. It was MVC2, it's ASP.NET 4. A lot's changed in the last four years. I don't know if I wanna to have to go back and remember all those conventions. But at the end of the day, if you're an engineer working on old code and you wanna do something like introduce Angular to the project, is it in your current soda? If it is not, you're probably violating a very important heuristic, because what's gonna happen when you violate that? You're gonna tell your boss, hey, I'm gonna rewrite, it's a good thing, believe me, I'm using Angular, it's the current state of the art, and this is where the industry state of the art can get you in trouble as an individual engineer. Just because it's in the industry state of the art doesn't mean it's in yours. If you've never worked with these technologies, nine times out of 10 what happens, you tell the boss it'll be done in three months. In three months you actually figure out why you shouldn't have picked Angular, and now you're trying to save face. I'm gonna deliver, I'm gonna drag it across the line. Now you're working 60 hours a week, not 40. You're working through the weekends, you're not sleeping a whole lot. Five months comes and goes, and I'm now two months late on a project that could have been on time if I had just accepted what was in my state of the art. Is it fun always? No. But it's fiduciarily responsible, it's professionally responsible. If you're that engineer that decides, I'm gonna take this as an opportunity to grow my soda, upgrade everything to the current industry soda, you're working in a manner that's likely not professionally responsible and likely unethical. This heuristic is an important one, and this is the one that I see violated by most engineers on most teams and most organizations. This gets companies in more trouble than any other heuristic I've ever taught as a senior. Thank you, sir. I got one. <laughs> uh, now, I'm gonna pick on a few other technologies, but remember, I'm not picking on the tech, I'm picking on the fact that developers like to pick these technologies and they're not in your soda. My current favorite is Kubernetes, and I don't mean that in a bad way for the Kubernetes folks. In fact, it's really good for you because a lot of people are gonna call you after they screw it up, they're committed, I gotta get this out the door, I don't know what I'm doing, there's a lot of work for consultants in that space. I make good money there. <laughs> you should not be making that decision. The other one, service fabric. For the love of God, people, please POC with that before you roll it out to prod. That one's getting a lot of developers in trouble right now. In my opinion, more unethical conduct is being performed under the umbrella of good things called microservices where developers don't properly have them in their soda. That includes, by the way, the client-side framework of the week game that we continue to play. Svelte looks awesome. I need a minute to learn it before you surprise me with it on Monday. Please do not do that, that is unethical. Domain-driven design, another one. I can tell you as an engineer who's been wrestling with domain-driven design for a long time, that is not something you should offer to a junior engineer to read over a weekend. <laughs> heuristic number two builds on heuristic number one. Are the current tools, languages, frameworks, and approaches in the soda of my team. Now, you end up in this heuristic when you violate heuristic number one. Or somebody comes in and the team thinks it's an awesome idea that somebody actually had the courage to go home and force it on the man. Like, this one's coming down the pipe, guys. As a team, what's gonna happen, and again, I'm gonna give you a real world example. I have a client right now, a developer on this team, decided that they were going to roll out on top of service fabric. Now I'm gonna tell you what they did and I'm gonna try and I'm gonna describe the problem that they were trying to solve. And it should be obvious that there was a, a gap in, in necessity on this one. But they decided they were gonna roll out on service fabric. Not one person on the team had any experience with microservices, much less service fabric. Now it was a small project, it was scoped out. Uh, the actual client side bill was about 300 hours. So keep that in mind. If you're working 30 hours a week, you got a dedicated developer, we're talking about three months, plus testing a little bit of feedback. Nine months later, nine months later, the app has still not actually been presented to the QA team. The QA team has still not been able to get their hands on that and make sure that the value's been delivered. Now, worse, the number of developers on that project trying to drag it across the finish line has grown from two to six. And because it's an emergency fire drill, it's all the senior engineers in the organization are now focused on trying to solve that problem. A year later, six senior engineers for a 300 hour project because service fabric. Now, we asked the question, why? Why are we clinging to it? The answer we got was industry best practices, industry soda. 
It's great that the industry has a soda. It's great that we're gonna say that as an industry, we should really double down on this microservices thing. You know, I can make a joke about Martin Fowler's first rule of distribution, but there's actually a good reason to distribute. But it really needs to be in your soda. In this particular case, in a world where accountability happens, who does the CIO call? Who's held accountable for making this decision? It will be the CIO, but who's the CIO gonna bring along? Somewhere along the way, the collective known as the engineers making these decisions, or somebody's gonna have to start raising their hand and saying, boss, I made that decision. I could just go to Git, run blame, and I could see who started wiring that stuff in. Don't forget that there's always a trail there. But in an accountability world, this project, by the way, we did a, a short calculation. It was a project budgeted at about $80,000 and again over three months. The project has currently exceeded $500,000 and has not been delivered to the clients. Who's responsible for that $420,000 difference? Now, in a world where we're held accountable, somebody's probably not gonna work in this profession again. I gotta be honest with you. If my doctor were treating my kids, let's say they knew what the, the, the actual remedy was, and let's say it was old world as hell. Do you think I care as a parent? My, my kid's got a problem, you can fix it, fix it. What if the doctor took it upon themselves to say, hey, I could fix it when I get a minute, like I could do what was old, but let me try something completely experimental, and as a last shot, if that fails, then I'll come back and cure your kid. I promise you it, it wouldn't go the way it's currently going in our profession right now, right? Now this last one builds on the first two, and this is a big one. This is the one that we spend the most time on as a firm, and this is the heuristic most violated in our profession. Does the engineering value of your current project or product exceed the business value needed? Now the example I just gave you, the app that was rolling out or is trying to roll out on Service Fabric, that app was for 30 internal users. Now I gotta ask, I mean, 500,000 and six senior level engineers in Service Fabric to roll out an MVC app for 30 users that could run from a, a laptop built in 1999 if it had to. Did we really need Service Fabric? Now in that case, when your executive walks down the hall with this very basic heuristic and says, guys, did the engineering value of this not maybe just a little bit exceed the business value necessary? Who, who gets to raise their hand and say, boss, I thought it was a good idea to force service fabric on the organization because it's in the industry soda? And again, I gotta pick on the Kubernetes crowd. It's not that I hate Kubernetes. I actually think that Kubernetes is a, is a fantastic technology in the hands of somebody who has it in their soda. Right now, too many engineers are allowed to make the decision of Kubernetes for their organization without any due oversight or any due process. Kubernetes is a fantastic tech, but there are some dangers lurking in those waters if you don't know what you're doing. You also, by the way, don't know what you're forcing on the organization. In the case of the service fabric example, the thing that actually they stubbed their toe on, the developers had no idea how the network engineers were wiring in security, because their developer machines don't have that. So from a developer perspective, it was all aces until we went to deploy. They, was, they were doing demos. We, we actually got to participate in demos, but now try to deploy it. So we're talking about an organization with a virtual server farm. You have no idea how that network's being wired in. Well, they were making some very deliberate choices and they're still trying to unwind it. It ended in a call to Microsoft. Microsoft scratched their head and said, I have no idea how we're gonna help you out on that. If the engineering value of your product exceeds business value, you're likely working in a very professionally irresponsible and unethical manner. And I'm gonna pick on the startups. If you're working on, a, on an innovation or a startup project, and you're already worried about scaling out your Kubernetes grid, you're probably doing it wrong. Right? You, you probably should be focused on the customer value, not the perfect infrastructure that you're trying to deploy. And this happens even in internal organizations. Engineering value can easily be quantified by how many problems are you solving that you don't have? When you're building an architecture, the question really quite properly needs to be, if we want Kubernetes in our architecture, what problem does it solve? If it doesn't solve a problem, we probably don't need it. It's that simple. 
bringing this back to what if your career actually depended on the success of your next project? Right now, it's a, I was joking before the presentation, I almost put the AT&T commercial in, the one where the, the mom and the kid get in the Ferris wheel, and the mom says, this doesn't look very safe, and the guy says, it's probably okay. And the kid said, well, what happens if something goes wrong? And he says, we move to the next town. I feel like the current software environment matches that commercial quite a bit. You know, when developers make a mistake right now, we're like, ah, it happens. You know, uh, we'll get it right on the next one. Uh, we'll fix it in the rewrite. Um, so what if your career actually depended on the decisions you were making? What if you actually had to go down and account for the $420,000 miss that you just had on the project? What if you were that developer that was like, I think this is a good idea, right? That world's coming. Um, these three heuristics for us as applied has saved us so much grief. It's also, by the way, helped us better train our engineers. You know, when an engineer comes in and says, hey, I think this technology is a great idea for the next project. Awesome, we created a whole process for helping you grow your soda without putting that project at risk. When a team comes in and wants to argue or fight for a technology that we probably should be looking at, because as an old guy, I gotta be honest with you, I transitioned into get off my lawn a long time ago. It all looks the same to me. Svelte, it might be exciting. You go to Svelte's website and it might look amazing. To me, it's JavaScript, right? If you're gonna argue for that technology, the more experienced engineers, you've gotta create a process in your organization to allow people to grow their soda. That's how you discover new technology, but there needs to be a process for it. It's not this project, it's not the next client project. Go research with it a little bit. And then quite, how hard is it, honestly, to go back, go back to your office and quantify the current project you're working on. Ask yourself, just very basically, does the engineering value of this maybe exceed the, the business value? If so, you, you might wanna get ahead of that just a little bit. What can you take away from this presentation? I'm going to ask, and I'm gonna be posting this with links by the way, but when you get back to your office, I'm gonna encourage you guys, if you haven't seen it, to read James Moore's 1985 paper on computer ethics. For those of you who go to UNF, this is an old paper, you probably already read it. I'm gonna ask you to reread it. In that paper, James Moore talks about something that we call logical malleability. It is the foundation of computer ethics because James Moore argues that as software engineers, we touch things that others don't see. People that use our software don't know that we modified the logic. So in that is an inherent responsibility to do good, not evil. It is quite easily the, the starting point of computer ethics across most universities in this country, if, if not the world at this point. Get a copy of the paper and read it because I promise you it's going to be the genesis for most of what we call accountability. Who touched the code? More importantly, who changed the logic and what are the ramifications of that? Again, Boeing. I'm just saying, the logic failed on that one. QA missed it. Some engineers found it late and the business tried to fix it in a patch. Didn't go so well. Logical malleability. Go back and start asking questions in your organization. Who is accountable, by the way, when you guys make mistakes? Who answers for that? You guys ever think about that? Like I was an executive in a firm before I started my own business, and I never even really thought about it, to be honest. I was a software engineer and I was not a good employee. Uh, I don't know if Mike Cleary's in here, but I worked with Mike Cleary and Sean Paley at Beeline back in the day, uh, and Richard White, and, and after I left, I actually sent Richard an email and apologized for being like the worst pain in the ass as an employee. I was the, the most brazen. You, you, you ever hear the term code fearlessly? It was a thing we went through like 20 years ago. Take chances, rip that code out. This is what we said to each other. Go after it. Um, yeah, 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 right. Break things, right? Code fast and break things. Well, at the end of the day, somebody's held accountable for that. And I think it would be good if you guys went back and started asking those questions. Like if I make a mistake, who is held accountable? Is it the CFO, is it the CIO? Like how does that actually go down in your organization? Develop a bone for that, get a little bit sensitive. Last, there is a thing called economics. And we don't really focus on it too much in this industry unless you're in a startup and you've got this thing called a run rate and you have to be worried about getting a job. Then economics becomes like your daily life. But as a software engineer, accountability is always tied to economics. When you make a mistake, there's a fiducial cost to that. Right? Do you understand the economics of the software you're building? There are models for this. Like, are you building a turd? Like, am I gonna give my boss this thing that so, it was so easy to deliver? but the maintenance cost of this thing is so exorbitant the business can't own it. So between accountability and economics, there's a whole host of questions that you and your teams can be asking that'll set you up to be in a more accountable universe. When accountability actually gets here, and it's getting here, it's coming, I'm telling you it's coming. 
You're going to be prepared to answer these questions in a way that says, yep, already thought about it. Yep, our decision framework's already in place. We don't have issues here. And by the way, you're actually going to create more profitable software. And I promise you too, as engineers, you'll be happier. When you actually figure out how you wrestle with both growing a skill set and delivering a project and understand these aren't the same thing, you don't have to put them in the same pool, you'll be happier as developers. All right, guys, I appreciate your time and I hope you guys took something out of it.